Welcome to the Paradigm Shift episode 135. That's 135 weeks in a row. Special start time tonight, uh, 6 o'clock Eastern, 3 o'clock Pacific. Let's have some fun. Let's get nuts. We have a very special guest on today. I couldn't be more excited. I see my partner crying, Big Dave, on. I'm going to bring that sex goose up right now. And let's get this party started, baby. How's everybody feeling tonight? Let us know in the chats. And it's I see you, Big Dave. I just requested you. There he is. Hey. Hi, handsome. Hello. What's Hello. going on? It's good. Just got back from some uh, wedding venue. Searching, looking, whatever the right word is. I just, yeah. uh, I was thinking of you. I got invited to uh, Eckler's wedding uh, out in Vegas. So we're excited to lock in that date. And Already? Uh, Didn't you just get engaged? Just got engaged, man. He moves a lot back. You know, he's a decision maker. Understood. Understood. That's a beautiful view you got behind you, man. That's incredible. It's a nice one tonight, yeah. But my view is even better right now. Oh, that's my boy. What's going on? You got something? Where are you? I'm in Julie's office. Cool. My wife's office. Very nice. Um, we have a special guest coming on in, in about two minutes, but but as usual, I'll hit you with a question right out the gate, which I think will be valuable for the listeners today. Dave, what actually is your intuition? Yeah, for me, intuition is indicative of being aware. Too many people think that logic is somehow infused in intuition but it's really not. The best case example that I give to it is when I'm at my studio at the Wynn, uh, people will you know, roll a hard eight as I'm walking through the lobby to get to my studio and they'll always say, oh, I knew it. No, you did know it. You thought about hard eight and it could have been three rolls ago, five rolls ago or 50 rolls ago. Intuition is an elevation of awareness of something that is going to be relevant to you without the construct of linear time. And so I try my best to capture those things that I'm intuitively thinking and then track the clues uh, throughout my li linear journey in order to facilitate seeing patterns of things that have heightened my awareness, which then can elevate my logical choices by understanding intuition is an awareness to utilize my intelligence to be more in spirit or more inspired. Can you be on any more fire right now in addition to spirit? <laughs> well, it's a topic I study all all the time. So, uh, you know, looking at that has uh, been a great construct of elevating my statistical success and having fun with it as well, because I was someone who, you know, tried to talk about making intelligent choices from gut feelings when logic isn't inherent within the construct of intuition. Yeah. And some of the best decisions you'll make are not necessarily from logic, right? Like trusting the universe and surrendering and taking calculated risks. Yeah, but you have to know your timing and risk tolerance in order to calculate a risk. And so many people, once again, just utilize a gut feeling with no linear aspect or no quantitative analysis. If you know your timing and risk tolerance, then you have a construct in which to utilize your intuition from. So these risk and that you talk about have to be tied to some sort of intelligence, some sort of inspiration, some sort of construct. And people just work in the ethereal with no construct and no foundational principles. And then they wonder why they can't find some sort of pattern or some sort of statistical success in how they're thinking and what they're doing. I know there's someone out here right now that's saying, what does that mean exactly quantitative analysis? Yeah, so there's two ways to quantify everything. One is space, and utilizing space to quantify things is extremely complex. Uh, you would have to have an extraordinary comprehension of physics, quantum physics, and metaphysics in order to facilitate quantifying or counting something by the space in which it, uh, it, it, it possesses. Uh, time is much easier. Uh, time is a simple construct. It's uh, created from the particle of sun, that leaves and hits the earth, it's 24 hours. And so, you know, let's take something that's ethereal like guilt. How can I improve on not being and feeling so guilty? Well, 
quantify how much time you spend feeling guilty today and try to shorten the amount of time that you feel guilty tomorrow. And now we have a quantifiable, a measurable, a counting way to see what human capability is incapable of seeing, which is progress. And so I use time because it's much more simple. I'm not that smart. Can't figure out the hyper complexities of the trillions of variables that exist in physics, quantum physics, and metaphysics to measure things with space. So I use the simplicity of a particle of light leaving the sun, hitting the earth, and creating 24 hours in a day. Yeah. And, and things like shame and guilt are things that are in the way interfering. Yeah. And that's why it has fear in it, F E A R. And when we can identify fear, knowing that when we're afraid that our natural reaction to fear is ego. And so if we can once again quantify the reaction itself and the amount of time that we spend in reacting to fear, we then can improve the behaviors in the progress of a trajectory or goal or an objective in a trajectory of where we want to be or better each day mutually exclusive from the past day and the future day, the only tie-in that we want to give in the construct of each day is we want to give the meaning of the past aligned with today's trajectory of the future. And that's how we tie together these individual periodic time frames of 24 hours. Yeah. Quantitative analysis and, and stuff like that is one of the coolest, most helpful things that you personally taught me. Yeah, and you know, I was coaching someone today and I realized that within the construct of uh, this time is how long of periodic behavior do we have? So I believe in enjoying the consistent every day, persistent without quit pursuit of my potential. Now, I just got back from a mastermind in Tahiti with an inner circle mastermind. And, you know, they had a 12 hour sit on a rock meditative experience. And I was suggesting that, you know, that is a great experience to have, but don't limit yourself in that day without taking a minimum of 10 minutes to study your calendar, or a minimum of 10 minutes to call your mom, or a minimum of 10 minutes to, uh, you know, check your emails. And, you know, I think a lot of people are resistant to understanding the periodic nature of time that they would have an exponential benefit by being able to put a weighted balance of prioritization each day of your activities and you know not have to go off the grid completely when you spend a majority of your time in the day in a meditative experience like sitting on a rock or breath work or running a marathon or whatever you're doing it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive from activity you get paid for in fact i believe it keeps you in the flow and allows you to enjoy the activity you get paid for more or the other way around when you have the days where you may have a 16 hour day with all the coaching, speaking, all the different business aspects of what you're doing to take a minimum of 10 minutes to vacation. And so this is my own personal perspective. Uh, it's based off of math. It's based off of phys physics of the conscious continuum, but there's no scientific proof, nor do I put it onto someone that tells me I need to go off the grid for five days or two weeks or two months every year in order to facilitate recovery. I believe in recovery and access every day at the highest level so that it doesn't build up exponentially that I need six weeks to recover, right? I may need six minutes, I may need six hours, but I will never need six, eight days. And I'm utilizing the conscious continuum as I understand it to be productive, accessible, and gracious. Other people may not wanna be as productive, may not wanna be as accessible, and may not want to be able to find the light, the love, and the lessons, what I define as gra of, of great, gracious or gravitas. We're gonna bring on our guest right, right now. Um, I'm just curious, great guest, by the way. How was your suggestion received at, at the Mastermind? Oh. It's always received the same way. 10% love it no matter what I say. 80% were contemplating it and applying it to their lives with the pieces and parts that resonate with them. And 10% thought it was bullshit, hated it. It was Tabasco in a wound and thought I was an idiot. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. I'm bringing on... Uh, and I love all 100%. Right now. 
Mike, we're trying to bring you on right now. I, we always have a little bit of trouble recently. If you can, request me, and then I can accept the request. Right, Dave? Yeah. Right. And make sure you're following Craig and I. For some reason, they're getting a little stickier on not allowing us to have people join us that aren't following both of us. Yeah. Uh, I found that to be a little bit of resistance as well and interference in the world of IG, the Instagram Live uh, as well. Let me ask you a question. Uh, looking for a venue for me was a very uh, anxiety full experience uh, because a weighted balance of others' interest, outside interest, uh, but yet the economics uh, are always creating stress. Oh, we'll get started. That's fine. We'll ask later. <laughs> Mike, how you doing? Thank you for joining oh, us. Amazing. Thanks for that. How you guys doing? We're doing amazing. Great. <laughs> Where are you dialing in from? Where are you right now? I am in Toronto, although my body and my brain is still in Australia because I, I got off a plane 24 hours ago from Australia. So I'm in that kind of time shift. I need David's quantum shifting thing. <laughs> like, I'm like, I just, I just got, got in from Tahiti a few hours ago. That's why we're a little later in the day. We could yeah. have flown together. You could have met me in Tahiti. We could have flown back. Well, I should have done that. Stopping at Tahiti sounds like a really fine idea now you, now you mention it. Yeah. <laughs> How long is the flight from Australia to Toronto? It, it nuts out at about 24 hours. It's like 17 hours from Australia to Vancouver and then another four or five or hours from Vancouver to Toronto with, you know, a couple of hours in the middle. So it's, and it's like a 15 hour time shift. That's what really kills you. It's, uh, it's the number of time zones you hop over. <laughs> How do you make the most and stay productive on that long of a flight? Well, um, <laughs> I've learned that I shouldn't necessarily make the most of the free champagne that gets offered. I'm like, it's like, you know, part, like I'm, I got to fly business class this time. And I'm like, okay, that's quite a lot of money. I need to make up the difference between economy and business by, by drinking free champagne. And I'm like, that is not a good short term or a long term strategy. Yeah. But actually, I've, I've been using something. I just used it this one time. It's called Flykit, F-L-Y-K-I-T-T. And it actually gives you a protocol to um, actually help uh, kind of bust jet lag. So it tells you when to sleep. It gives you supplements to take at certain times. It tells you when to put on uh, light canceling glasses. And I have to say, so far, it's been outstanding in terms of its impact. Um, cool. But you know, I try and read. Like, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've really lost the ability to read like I used to. I, I, and, you know, I have a master's degree in literature. And I, and I write books for a living. So I'm like, I'm a pretty good reader, or at least I used to be. So I, this trip, I was like, Michael, learn how, to read a, learn how to read a serious book again. And so I spent a bunch of time uh, digging into that. Yeah. It's so interesting, Michael, that you said that. I'm, I'm reading a book called The 4,000 Weeks. Uh, I study time. Yeah, Oliver, and, Ber Oliver Berkman. It's a great book. Yeah. And in the book, he talks about why we have difficult times reading and how important it is to read and just the maturation of the way that we practice uh, getting information is those paragraphs become obtrusive to us uh, <laughs> when we have little bite size information and advertising bite size and Instagram and TikTok and right. all of these things are bite sized when we have to turn pages and see paragraphs. Yeah. Uh, there's a subconscious resistance uh, to that. And there is, you know, there, there's certain things that's so interesting because I think it's creating a separation that not everyone understands. The easy things to understand is, hey, if you don't apply check, uh, AI to your life, there's going to be a chasm. There's going to yeah. be a void and, and a difference. But I'm the other way. Like, I believe that if you don't know how to interact with people in person, there's going to be a huge void for those that are really good at it. And I also believe that those people that know how to do research and read, uh, yeah. which, which is something I'm, you know, hour and a half a day I spend doing research. Um, and I think th those are two areas that are anti-tech, but will right. create just as big as an advantage in the next 10 years as using AI will. You know, David, when you were talking before and you're talking about finding the 10 minutes in the six hours, whether that's the 10 minutes of work within six hours of meditation or the 10 minutes of meditation within the six hours of work. It reminded me of the kind of the yin yang symbol, you know, where you've got the, the two shapes and then you've got the little dot of the other color within the bigger shape. Cause there's always the in, inside the one color is the other thing. It's that sort of pattern. And it feels the same with these core skills around interact being, hu being human.
<laughs> and being able to think in a, in a holistic and strategic way, these are skills that feel like they're essential regardless of how technology moves and shifts and alters some of the, some of the landscape. Does that yeah. apply to one glass of champagne with our supplements and our light <laughs> therapy and everything exactly. else? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it'd be foolish not to have one free glass of champagne. It's, <laughs> it's, it's when you're hitting 11, that's when it really gets kind of messy. Yeah. <laughs> Very. This is so good. And maybe we should stay there for a second. And there's so many places we can take this conversation. For anyone on in, in Dave and I's community, if you weren't familiar with Michael, do a deep dive, play catch up. In regards to late relationships, Michael, I know that's something that you really take pride in and Dave mm -hmm. as well. What is a good way for someone that wants to go out there and be a little more intentional and strategic to create great relationships? And like, what should be the thought process for somebody to start creating great relationships? Well, here's the, here's the strong point of view I've got on that. Um, first of all, recognize what a significant impact the quality of your relationships and the quality of your working relationships have. Like if you think of the, the, the bad working relationships you have and how that's dragged you down and, and chipped away at your confidence and impacted your work. And you think of the great working relationships you've had and how that's expanded your sense of self and your capacity and your confidence and your autonomy. It, they make such a big difference. But I do think most of us just kind of cross our fingers and hope for the best. <laughs> We're like, hey, I hope David doesn't suck. I hope Craig doesn't suck too much. Um, <laughs> We'll see how it goes. And the, the core tactic and strategy that I use around this is something called a keystone conversation. And it's this, have a conversation about how you work together before you get into working together. Or if you're already working, stop, look at the other person in the eye and go, hey, how should we best work together so we can best do the work together? It's a conversation about the relationship and kind of like, how will we bring out our best and how will we avoid kind of our worst so that you can, you can avoid the pitfalls, you can avoid tripping each other up and you have the best chance of building a best possible relationship. It's so good because it's inevitable that there'll be some butting of heads. So you might of have course. Some awareness and talk about right. it from the beginning, right Dave? Yeah, and there's two uh, axes to this analysis that I love. And one is relativity, which is in the root of relationship. And we can have relationships not only with people, but with food and location, mm -hmm. alcohol. We, we have these relationships. And so I think it's important to see how relative is this person, place, or thing to my life, and then analyze the spectrum of feeding and bleeding. Uh, and then I love the collaborative and coordinated type of exploration that we're going to do because that collaboration and coordination facilitates an exponentiality of an outcome. So by asking people, you know, hey, tell me more about what you're doing today, but also exploring what they like about what they're doing today, what they right. don't like, because to me, the connectivity or the transition that can occur in this collaboration is, hey, would it help you if, or right. do you know anyone that can help me? And I'm always aiming to get to those two questions, would it help you if, and do you know, or anyone that could help me only with people that are more relative? Because if what I found is I have, you know, an insecurity deep in me. And so I might have a friend from elementary school that I needed to validate me for so many years. And now that I'm 55, I'm still trying to seek validation just because he was a lot cooler than me in sixth grade. And I had to figure out hey, this sucker is bleeding me and he has no relativity in my life since the yeah. sixth grade. Why am I letting him be so relative and be such a bleeder? Yeah, I love that. You know, I, um, there's a writer I love. Uh, she's not so well known now because she, she died quite young, actually, probably about our age, David, 55. Um, that is young, by the way. That's very it's, young. When I was 35, I thought 55 was oldish. Now I'm 55, I'm like, this is peak. This is prime youth. <laughs> exactly. uh, but anyway, this writer is called Debbie Ford. She wrote a book called The Dark Side of the Light Chasers. It's, mm. it's a bit kind of woo-woo. It's a bit Californian, but it's profound. It's based on Jungian shadow work. And David, what you're reminding me of is this um, process she has where she goes, look, the person who triggers you, the person who winds you up, 
what they're doing is they're speaking to the part of you that is not yet integrated, not yet complete. Mm. So it's, this is a, I mean, this is a quick pro, uh, exercise I can give you, but it's really powerful. You, you think of somebody who's annoying you, <laughs> you know, who triggers you, who frustrates you. I mean, most of us can bring somebody to mind pretty quickly. You, usually a and then, family and, member, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely family members. Like somebody once said, you know, your, your, your soulmate is the person who knows how to press all your buttons. Yeah, that's, I think that's a pretty good definition. So you, what you do is you write down all the things that drives you nuts about that person. You know, Simon is greedy and ambitious and nasty and self-centered and, and, and. And that's quite cathartic because you get to kind of get it off your chest. But then what you do is you flip it around and you cross out Simon and you write, I am, I am greedy. I am selfish. I am self-obsessed. I am, I am, I am. Very provocative. But um, I found in doing that work with a bunch of the people who kind of haunted my head, haunted my life. It's like whether it was the, sixth, the guy from sixth grade who was still bugging me or a boss. I found it was a way of releasing them, releasing the kind of the power they had over me. Because in a way I was like, into, I was owning that shadow side of myself. It's true about me, but it also meant that it wasn't driving me anymore. It wasn't triggering me so much anymore. That's the, like, so it, it, we know I hit my quantum transformation, my quantum shift and my basement had a basement from all the dumb things I were doing and the dumb people I surrounded myself with. But I, when I hit my basement, I, I hated four people. And it was really interesting. And, and I, I hated them for being liars and cheaters, manipulators, oversellers, back-end sellers. Yeah. And it was my mom, my dad, my best friend since the fourth grade, and my wife. And as I sat there contemplating, everyone loved me, except for these four people didn't love me because they were telling me the truth. I realized that I didn't hate any of them. I hated myself. Right. And I was, I am a liar, a cheater, a manipulator. Yeah. And that changed my life, that shadow work, like you said. And I always say to the coaching clients I have when they are so upset, I said, if, if you're that upset, think about why. And I mm -hmm. promise you, there's a reflection in the why. And others are mirrors of ourselves. And it's as right. simple as that one of the Sanskrit rules of being human. Others are a mirror of ourselves. Craig, what else you got for us? This guy's a genius and he's tired. Imagine if he wasn't tired. Me? <laughs> oh, my. Uh, yeah, no, Michael, you certainly yeah. do. Yeah. You're, never, you're never tired, man. You're too, you're too fit. This is all mentally fit. Oh, well, let, fit. Let, me, let me, let me, so you, you were talking, uh, David, I'll get this slightly wrong, but it's like, uh, I think you're, the question you wanted to trade with the person you're building a relationship with is like, how can I help you do the thing you want to do? How can you help me do the thing I want to do? Which is a great question. I like a question that's a little further upstream. So the question I ask is, I call it the amplify question. And it's, what's your best? What's your best? And what I mean by that is, when do you shine and when do you flow? Because here's what happens. Like, I'm I like, David, you and I have met before. Craig, you and I are meeting for the first time. I've just already made up a bunch of stuff about you, about who you are, what you do, what you're good at, what you're not good at. Um, you know, and you know, it's just me, you know, as David said, you're all mirrors of me. So I'm just projecting a whole bunch of stuff. All my biases are coming through. You know, I've got a thing for guys that are good looking in 55. So you know, David <laughs> and I, brilliant. <laughs> I, I'm not sure about young punks, so like, yeah, I'm not sure about Craig, but whatever, I can you know, make it up. I can live with that. Um, but when I go, so David, tell me when you shine and when you flow. You know, and I'm talking about the flow state, me hey, kick me hey, and shining when you've got that kind of glint in your eyes. The thing about David, for instance, is he's a really accomplished guy. He's got 55 years of stuff he's been doing. He's pretty good at a whole bunch of stuff. He's launched companies, he's made money, he's influenced people, he's coached people. But what you're good at is not necessarily what makes you shine and what makes you flow. And if David and I were kind of figuring out a way of working together or partnering up in some way, um, or just kind of building a kind of, uh, you know, he's hired me and he's now become my boss. If I get to talk to him and he's like, here's when I shine and when I flow, and I go, David, here's when I shine and here's when I flow, then we both got this kind of shared understanding and shared commitment to try and bring out the best of each other. And I think it's a more helpful question than what are you good at? 
because quite frankly, there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm good at that I'm delighted if I never have to do again in my life. And it's also not what are your strengths or what are your values? Because as interesting as those can be, I never know what to do with that. You know, I'm like, I, you know, those are great that those are your strengths, but that doesn't actually tell me how to work with you. It doesn't actually tell me what the, the culmination of you in that moment where you're bringing experience and strength and skills and passion, what that looks like. And that's what I'm hungry to learn. Yeah, it's so interesting because it really, there's these relationships of, you know, where and, and how, but it, it's three different separate things. It's one, when, when we're collaborating, I can mentor you, meaning there's situations where, hey, I've done this, you, you know, I do this with book writing and Craig and I had this conversation, like, Craig, I've written eight books, dude. Why didn't you ask me how to get to where you want to be? There, there's a lot of straight out street hustles in book publishing and distribution yeah. and marketing. Why do you want to get hustled when I've already been hustled and I can tell you how not exactly. to get hustled? Right. Yeah. And then two, there's teaching, which to me is the most challenging because I, I lack the, the patience that my mom had, who's a consummate teacher, to explain what I mean fully mm -hmm. so that I'm not at a, a level that people are like, what the F did Dave Meltzer just say? That That's like such a Meltzerism, quantum <laughs> physics and shifts. And that doesn't make any, that going to help me, Dave. But what you're talking about is so great because none of it matters unless we bring the best out of people. And th that's the coach, that's the coach side. And, you know, ironically, that's one of the things that, you know, puts me in the flow is when I can bring the best out of other people, right. uh, really, you know, rocks my world and allows me to be at my best. Because this is what I would love to, like, I hear your commitment to bringing out the best in others. But if I was in, if, if you were, if I was hiring you as my coach, David, I'd be going, David, what type of client brings out the best of you as a coach? Because I, you've had clients and they're on a bell curve. You've had a few that you're like, oh my goodness, we are just a perfect fit. There are a few where you're like, I feel bad taking your money because yeah. this, this whole thing is sucking. You know, like, and I, it's not really you or me, it's us. We're just, it's just not working. And then you've got a bunch in the middle where you're like, it's pretty good. I did a pretty good job. They got value. But I'm like, tell me about the people at that end of the bell curve. Well, the ones that where you're like, oh my God, Michael's, I'm talking to Michael today. I can't wait. Because I want that, I want to be that person for you. And I want to tell you, because I've had a bunch of coaches in my time. And but I know a lot about coaching. And it means that I am very, very slippery with coaches. Because I can, I can talk the talk. I can make it look like I'm being vulnerable. But I, I am, I'm like an eel when I'm being coached. So I'm like, let me tell you about the coaches that actually got to pin me down and figure me out and make me sweat and make me work. This is what I want. And in that conversation, you and I have the opportunity to become a really powerful partnership. This is great. It's so funny like this, just to be transparent, I, I only can handle 100 one-on-one -on -one coaching clients with the methodology that I use. And it, we have this conversation, Colleen, my president, uh, out of the 100, 63 of them, and I use as a criteria, 63 of them, I can't wait to talk to. Right. I can't, I, I, I literally, I can't believe I'm paid to do this. I can't believe the progress we're making. I, it, it's like when you were young and you got to talk to your, your grandparents and, and you get excited that, oh my gosh, you know, I get to call grandma and, you know, just get that unconditional love. Uh, it, it, that's how I feel with 63 of 100. I feel blessed to have yeah. that many out of 100. Um, and when I feel the other side of it, though, I, I do fire those clients. I, I just let them right. know I'm not the right person for you. And I think the same holds true with therapists too. Uh, anyone that's had therapy, because I'm like an eel to, to uh, therapists, you know, I'm the same way. Yeah. They, they think they got it all figured out and I'm like, this is a yeah. waste of time. Exactly. I had David talk to me for 25 minutes about quantum physics. <laughs> I, was, I, I, I thought that was a thrillingly good episode. And David's like, yeah, I just kind of I just bamboozled you for 25 minutes. <laughs> and it's so annoying because you're colluding against your best interests. And yeah. that's why you want to have these conversations, which is like, you know, the, it, it, this book I've got called How to Work with Almost Anyone, I talk about the best possible relationship and it needs to be safe and vital and repairable. So safe is psychological safety, which is like, are you able to be yourself? Are you able to show up? 
but safety is not enough for me. I want vitality. I want provocation. I want challenge. I want risk. I want some danger. And I also want the ability to know how we fix it when things go wrong. Because as you said earlier, David, it, it, it'll go wrong somewhere down the line. You know, it'll go off the rails a bit. So you're trying to build whoever the other person is, the best version of safe and vital and repairable for you and that other person. What I love about this, besides the obvious, is that just because you are a great coach, you add a lot of value, doesn't necessarily mean you're the right fit for, for someone. It Just like anything, the relationship has to be in alignment. And if it's not, that's okay. Yeah. But let's have some awareness. This is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and then also, real quick, I just wanted to ask you guys, when you say like an eel, what do you mean by that? Well, for me, uh, like, I, I can't BS like David can BS because he's like a black belt, obviously. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm pretty good. I am pretty good. And so, you know, I, I know most of the, I, first of all, I know most of the coaching models and most of the coaching processes. So I can always pull out of it because I kind of know what's going on. I'm a really good facilitator. So this, it's often I'll actually flip it and I end up kind of facilitating. And I can also be really charming. I mean, that's not obvious right now, but I can be, trust me. I mean, I, I, know, I know it seems unbelievable. So I can be, get it to a point where the coach is like, oh, he's, he's funny and he's self-deprecating and he's charming and he's interesting. Cause I'll end up going, oh, hey coach, that this reminds me of this thing. Have you read this book? It's, it's a great model. It kind of goes like this. And before I know it, I'm kind of like, I've become the, I'm leading the dance rather than being um, brave enough to give myself over to the process. Yeah. And one, uh, one thing to add to that, Craig, is just being a top to miss of being able to explain situations or the value that your coach is bringing in a very optimistic way. And then when you get outside of the engagement, you do a critical analysis. And a lot of times you're not as transparent of the value and there's other people that can bring you more value. And yet you haven't really communicated because you're a pleaser and you're positive and you want to validate your yeah. choice in that coach or that therapist. And so you don't really tell the truth about, Hey, you know what? This isn't really working out for me. And I think I should find someone else. Instead, you're like, that really helped. I've really healed the relationship with me and my mom. And meanwhile, you might get off and still feel the same way about your mom. Yeah. yeah. And also, Michael, you said something before. I thought it was really cool. When you said kind of upstream, like when you ask someone, like, where do you shine and where do you flow? I imagine there's some people that when you ask that to, they're actually articulating maybe for the first time where it is that they shine. Maybe they never took a second to really identify what that was. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So, you know, part of this, this book I've written, it's got these five questions to build a keystone conversation, questions you ask and answer so that you can build this best possible relationship. Um, but it, even though it's kind of a business book, it's got a self-help book kind of wrapped inside because each question has three exercises next to it to help you get more articulate and more specific and more granular and more courageous about naming some of these things. Because it's true, when you ask that question, there's, there's a percentage of the world that goes, oh, <laughs> I've been waiting my whole life for somebody to ask me this. I've been thinking about it. I've been polishing it. I've been fine tuning it. Here we go. Sit back because I've got a, I've got a, a list prepared. And then there's a bunch of people going, I'm not quite sure how to say it. I'm not quite sure if I'm allowed to say it. Is it culturally appropriate for me to, to boast? And I'm like, no, no, you, you're not boasting. This isn't, this isn't an ego play. This is an act of service to say to another person, I have enough self-awareness to say, this is the best of me. I would love you to get the best of me. So let me tell you what that is. So you and I have every chance of the best of me showing up. So it's not a kind of like, you know, look at me, I'm fabulous. It's wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if you and I both had the best of ourselves showing up when we're working together. It's dynamite, right, Dave? Amazing. And so land the plane, my brother. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I'll ask you one final question. I'm just curious for myself, Mike. I was checking out your awesome content and I saw you say this, and, and I'm genuinely curious, I know it's not the audience, that great problem solving is all about solving the real problem. Yeah. What is the real problem. <laughs> well, it depends on the conversation, of course, but 
you know, the, the book I'm best known for is a book called The Coaching Habit. It sold one point something million, which is amazing. No um, big and deal. It's quite, yeah, well, and it was still published because it got turned down by the publishers many times. So I ended up self publishing. And so I now have this sense of smugness that goes along with book sales. So it's fantastic. Um, and the question that this is the, the, strat, the, the focus question, which is what's the real challenge here for you? And the key insight is simply this. The first challenge that shows up is almost never the real challenge. It's just the first challenge. And one of the most powerful shifts in in kind of role or an, an understanding of how you add value is to say, what if I was the person who figured out what the real problem was rather than the person who kept coming up with the fast answers? Because there's a lot of people who can come up with answers, but there are very few people who have the discipline and the focus and the curiosity to figure out what's, what's the hard thing to solve here? What's the real challenge here? So it's a really powerful question to put in your belt to be more coach-like. I love it. We which I think is, you know, a terrific way to end because it relates right back to I am. Uh, when we figure out the real problem, we have to fill in the I am and what am I doing to interfere with what I am. And I think in different varying degrees, a lot of people, number one, don't know what they want. So it's impossible to know what the real problem is. They don't know who they want to help or who can help them. So they can't figure out what the real problem is. And then they haven't really thought how can this person help me with how am I going to get this done? And so if they can shift the paradigm once again from listing out all these things outside of us and looking at I am and here's the trajectory of where I want to be or think I want to be and what am I doing to interfere with it, there we can get to the real problem, the real interference, the real fear, and then see how are we you know, naturally reacting to that fear, which believe it or not, Michael, before you even got here, this is a perfect close. We didn't prepare that way, but we opened and closed with the exact same lessons. And uh, please reach out. I mean, I haven't talked to you in a while, but I'd love to get uh, you on our TV show uh, that we're going to be doing November, December for your new book. I want to promote the old one and the new one. So thank you, thank sir. You so I appreciate much. that. Yeah. Hey, it's been wonderful. Thanks for having me on. I love seeing you both again. Michael, yeah. thank you. Have another glass on me. Take care. Thank you both <laughs> for your residents. Have a great rest of the weekend. All right. Bye. Thank you for Bye, being accommodating, Craig. Take care. Thank you, guys. Bye. My pleasure. Stay handsome, Dave. I'll, I'll try. <laughs> Love you guys. Fantastic conversation. Uh, nothing better that I'd rather do on a Saturday night than being with you two and being with the community so far. Um, to be honest with you guys, I just learned a lot. That was, that was really great. And uh, taking that curious approach and asking those questions and it's cool um, how to extract someone's sweet spot, their flow, where they shine. I just thought that was so interesting and something that I'd love to implement immediately. Uh, so thank you, Mike. Obviously, Big Dave, as always. For our audience that might not have been familiar, do yourself a favor. Um, grab Mike's books. Check out all the great stuff he's got going on. And thank me later. Dave, as always, love you. Uh, and we'll be back next week. Next week, we'll be in Nashville. I'll be speaking, but I'll be coming home, so we might move the show back an hour. Um, we'll send out uh, the notification and so forth. Love you guys. Have a great rest of the weekend. You dig?